And now I'm pleased to introduce Hannah Blank, a writer, lecturer, and teacher. She has lectured at Brandeis, Harvard, and Tufts universities, among others. Her past books include Virgin, The Untouched History, and Big Big Love, A Sex and Relationship Guide for People of Size and Those Who Love Them. Her work is also featured in numerous anthologies and periodicals. Her most recent book, Straight, gives us the brief history of heterosexuality, a term that wasn't even coined until the mid-19th century. Like the typewriter and the light bulb, the heterosexual was invented in the 1860s and swiftly and permanently transformed Western culture. Within half a century, heterosexual had become a byword for normal, enshrined as a new gold standard for human experience. With a broad scope and great detail, Straight tells the eye-opening story of a complex and often contradictory man-made creation that is all too often assumed to be an irreducible fact of biology. Before I turn things over to Ms. Blank, I'd just like to thank you for buying books from Harvard Bookstore. By doing so, you're supporting an independent business and ensuring the future of this author series. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Blank. Thank you so much to all of you for coming out. It's a fantastic crowd. Boston, Cambridge, you are always so good to me. That's why I'm moving back. Um, uh, this is Straight, the surprisingly short history of heterosexuality. And, um, and it is a surprisingly short history. One, the, the sort of the number one with a bullet question that I've gotten, I've been talking about this book now for um, four months. And the, the question that I keep getting, that keeps making me roll my eyes, it usually comes from journalists, is, but people have been having babies for millions and millions of years. How can heterosexuality be new? And I just smile and I say, yes, I know. Sexual reproduction is very confusing because it looks very much like heterosexuality if you squint. Um, but it is not, in fact, heterosexuality. And heterosexuality is, um, is a much more complex, a much more difficult to define thing. In fact, I, I try very hard to get away with not defining it, which is tricky when you've written a book. Um, and the way that I organized straight, uh, it was kind of an exercise in evading the responsibility of, of defining the term. Um, the actual history itself, the history of the term, is very, very brief. And I'm actually just going to synopsize it a little bit for you so that you have the background. Um, in the 1860s, as what, what we would now recognize as Germany was being organized and coming together as a, a modern nation state, they were, they were trying to work out their laws, their legal system. And they were doing this in large part the, the way you do when you inherit a whole bunch of legal codes from a whole bunch of tiny little countries. You try to sort of mush them together into a sort of fruit salad of legal codes, um, many of which were based in the laws of the Catholic Church, particularly where sexuality and regulation of relationships and bodies were concerned. Um, so paragraph 143 of the, of the Prussian legal code um, was their sodomy law. And it was pretty straightforward and only moderately draconian as such things went. Um, and it stated that um, any man who was found guilty of the crime of having sex with another man and anyone who had sex with an animal could be imprisoned five years hard labor and deprived of their civil liberties during the term of imprisonment. Um, and that law then, as it would be now, was considered unjust by a lot of people, not an, not an, un, uh, not an unlikely thing. And um, so there were a group of people involved in protesting this law, among them a, an Austro-Hungarian journalist named Karl Maria Kertbeni and a German legal scholar and jurist named Karl Ulrichs. And they were engaged in um, basically the 19th century, 19th century equivalent of blogging. They were writing pamphlets, often anonymously, and publishing them and handing them out to legislators, journalists, influential people. And they were writing a lot of letters back and forth. They were doing their best to influence public opinion. And this is where the term heterosexual gets coined. It gets coined as part of this lengthy correspondence and pamphlet writing exercise in a letter, May the 6th, 1868. I have a photostat of it at home in my files. Um, from Karl Maria Kertbeni to Karl Ulrichs, in which he proposes two terms, that essentially human beings are sexual. He just sort of es establishes that as a baseline. Human beings are sexual, and there are different ways in which human beings can be sexual, and they can be homosexual, they can be interested in same 
sex, same biological sex, sex. They can be heterosexual. They can be interested in different sexed partners. But essentially, the way he phrased it, there was no implied hierarchy. And I often compare this to saying, you know, there are throw pillows and there are bed pillows. They're all pillows. They're soft. They're squishy. We like them. They're friendly. So there's sex. It's soft, it's squishy, we like it, it's friendly, and there are different ways that we can go about this business of sex and different patterns that we can have. That's where the term comes from, 1868. It makes its way into popular parlance via our good friends, the psychiatrists, um, particularly through Richard von Kraft, Ebing's Psychopathia Sexualis, which is 1886, um, and then again, 1889 and, and thereafter. And uh, th these works, Psychopathia Sexualis and many of the subsequent works in which heterosexual comes to us were actually what we could call um, medico-legal works. Kraft Abing's goal in writing Psychopathia Sexualis was to create a compendium, and I quote, of disorders of the sexual instinct for the use of people who worked with having to categorize and diagnose and talk about and talk to and punish these people in the legal system. It was intended as a sort of a, a professional aid to lawyers, to judges, to jurists, to legislators. That was Kraft Abing's purpose for writing Psychopathia Sexualis. And so heterosexual comes to us through Psychopathia Sexualis, among other places, but that's sort of the first place it shows up in print. And it, come, it shows up as an equal term used in, interchangeably with the term normal sexual. Kraft Aving never defines it. He doesn't give any examples of it. He doesn't say this is what it looks like, you know, this is what it quacks like, this is your duck. None of that. What he does is he, it gets defined by omission. This is the thing that is not a problem. Everything else in this book is a problem. These guys over here, not a problem. And so that is the way it comes down to us through the psychiatric literature. Freud uses it because Croft Abing uses it. Havelock Ellis uses it because Freud uses it. And the next thing you know, it's showing up in the New York Times in 1923 in a review of a book of Freud that's been translated into English. So that's, that's the path. That's the transmission path. And a after it sort of escapes into the wild, all kinds of things happen. And most of this book is devoted to talking about the kinds of things that happen, sort of the life and times of heterosexual, and how it comes to mean the things that it means to us today, how we use it today. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of jump around a little bit. The book is organized thematically because this is not a very comfortably chronological history. We don't have, you know, the, ba the great you know, battle of 1918, the heterosexuals won, that sort of thing. It's not that kind of history. It's a history of ideas. And so I'm kind of compelled to talk about it as a matter of ideas. And so I'm gonna begin by reading a bit from chapter three which is entitled Straight Science. And this chapter is about the relationship of the physical sciences to sexual orientation and specifically to heterosexuality. Scientifically speaking, we don't know much about heterosexuality. No one knows whether heterosexuality is the result of nature or nurture, caused by inaccessible subconscious developments, or just what happens when impressionable young people come under the influence of older heterosexuals. We don't know whether heterosexuals have different anatomy or physiology compared to non-heterosexuals. Our knowledge of any potential differences in terms of how heterosexuals' nervous systems respond to sexual stimulus compared to non-heterosexuals is non-existent. This isn't too surprising. We haven't been looking. No dedicated neurologist has ever hunched over microscope slides of brain tissue, teasing out telltale details that make a heterosexual brain heterosexual. Endocrinologists cannot give us the hormonal recipe for the biochemical cocktail that makes a person straight, nor have geneticists even tried to locate such a thing as a straight gene, except insofar as they often assume that genes are straight unless they're something else. Sociobiologists have yet to register any definitive statements on questions like whether being the firstborn or perhaps having a lot of older sisters or maybe being an only child increase one's odds of growing up 
heterosexual. Dozens, even hundreds of scientists have made careers, sometimes quite influential and lucrative ones, attempting to exa answer exactly these and similar questions where homosexuality is concerned. But somehow, heterosexuality seems always to be left out in the cold, with no one to show the slightest concern for its nature or workings. Interestingly enough, science has yet to prove that heterosexuality, or indeed any sexual orientation, exists in any way that is relevant to physical science. For this to be the case, heterosexuality would have to be demonstrated to have an objective, physical existence. It would have to be quantifiable in grams or nanometers or angstroms or joules. And it would have to be measurable in some way that wasn't dependent on having a human being with human biases be the judge of whether it existed. That is, it would register a weight on a scale. It would produce a chemical reaction in a test tube or give off light or heat, something like that. This is the nature of the search that goes on behind much of the research that looks for things like gay genes or gay hormones. The theory is that if physical evidence of homosexuality could be found, it would provide an objective foundation for sexual orientation and thus make it a legitimate object for empirical science. The same should therefore be true of heterosexuality. After all, in order for there to be the category gay brain, there must be an opposed non-gay brain. The confirmation of the existence of the marked category would simultaneously confirm the existence of the unmarked category. Neither has yet been confirmed to exist. This isn't for lack of trying. Many scientists have claimed to find evidence of homosexuality in the body and anatomy, genetics, and hormones, but none so far have hold up, held up to scrutiny. When we look for proof that this gay bit of the body is genuinely different from the default straight model, the evidence tends to fall apart. In the face of more than a century of trying and failing to find an empirical basis for sexual orientation, the depth of the faith that scientists continue to maintain that they will find it is almost touching. It's also very telling. There are a lot of people out there who very badly want the orthodoxy of sexual orientation in which we all have an enormous social investment to have a physical demonstrable existence. But the fact remains that science often look for evidence of non-heterosexuality, what we consider the exception to the rule, while assuming that heterosexuality itself requires no evidence. Scientifically speaking, this is precisely backwards. In science, it should technically not be possible to consider whether there might be an exception to a rule until you've proven that the rule exists. The fact that researchers have repeatedly assumed a material scientific validity for heterosexuality without actually looking for it is simultaneously problematic and completely unsurprising. That heterosexuality exists is an orthodoxy. Everyone knows that heterosexuality is real, but what's real from the standpoint of culture is not always or necessarily real from the standpoint of physical science as the example of phlogiston eloquently attests. Phlogiston was the name given in 1703 to something that learned scientific men had long assumed had to exist in order for the world to function the way it did. It was a colorless, odorless, tasteless, insubstantial substance that was capable of burning. Anything that could be burnt, it followed, contained phlogiston, and anything that contained phlogiston could have its phlogiston removed by burning it off. It wasn't until the 1780s that the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier proved that phlogiston did not, in fact, could not exist. Nevertheless, some very fine scientists, notably Joseph Priestley, the, you know, the guy who discovered oxygen, continued to cling to phlogiston theory for the very good reason that it was familiar, it was consistent, and it explained a lot of things that scientists had observed in the world. It's very possible that from the perspective of material science, including biomedical realm, heterosexuality and homosexuality both may be rather like phlogiston. No matter how formal the name sounds, heterosexuality was not, after all, developed as a scientific concept or according to anything like a scientific principle. As we'll recall, the idea of something called heterosexual was developed by non-scientists specifically for use in the very non-scientific milieu of law. 
from its very inception, heterosexual was about people as social entities participating in social interactions with one another in the larger context of their society, their nations, and their national law. There is nothing about the concept of heterosexuality that suggests, or in fact has ever suggested, that it must of necessity be an objective physical quality with a measurable physical existence. When heterosexual caught on in the sciences, it was through psychiatry, the branch of medical science to which the social is of maximum importance. Early psychiatry in particular was essentially non-biological in its orientation. Its practitioners studied medicine, but as we know from the work of Freud and his contemporaries, the state of the psychiatric art of the day had to do with memories and repression, dreams and the unconscious. The sorts of sophisticated biomedical models we use today when we talk about mental and behavioral medicine, neuroanatomy, biochemistry, neuropharmacology, those didn't exist yet. At the time when heterosexual was in its infancy, the existence of hormones was just being deduced. The word actually dates from 1905. And the earth-shattering news from the world of brain anatomy was the discovery of the Broca's area. The application of even the crudest physical biomedical experimentation on the problem of sexual response didn't begin until after 1910. Early psychiatry was part of the material science field by convention and because its practitioners had studied medicine, not because the practice of psychiatry had anything to do with physical science. Heterosexual, coined by a layman who was just trying to articulate a protest against a law, became scientific and medical because it was adopted and used by men who had medical educations, not because it had been revealed or proven by experimentation. As a psychiatric inheritance, heterosexual was promptly enshrined in medical practice as a standard of normalcy and proper function, and there it has remained. The overwhelming assumption among natural scientists who work on sexual orientation appears to be that heterosexuality, heterosexuality simply must exist as a physical reality. Were it not, the myriad attempts to explain homosexuality on biomedical grounds wouldn't make much sense, but the truth is no one has yet established or to my knowledge even attempted to establish that a quality called heterosexuality exists not as a social phenomenon but as a spontaneously appearing material entity in human beings. They only behave as if they had. So that's the opening to that little chapter. It was really fun to write that. I really enjoyed that. It was, and it was also quite a, quite a staggering moment when I, I was doing my research and I was, I was digging, digging, digging. I spent a lot of time, I live in Baltimore, and um, I spent a lot of time at Johns Hopkins Medical Library, Welch Medical Library, working with their librarians, digging through the stacks, digging through the medical literature, and just looking for anybody, anywhere, anything, where anybody had done any research on the, on the sort of the, the the material nature of heterosexuality. I could not find one reference. And the light went off in my head, which meant, oh, ding, 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 no one's looked for it. Everyone's been looking for the exception. No one's proven the existence of the rule. Isn't that fascinating? So I'm going to hop from that to the beginning of the chapter called The Pleasure Principle, which is um, a little history about some of the ways that we've learned to experience and expect heterosexuality to produce pleasure. It was a stupendous thing, and at 50 pounds sterling a night in the late 18th century, it better have been. James Graham's grand state celestial bed surrounded its occupants with celestial and electrical fire, serenaded them with music, tantalized them with stimulating vapors, and dazzled their eyes with a veritable forest of gleaming glass columns and a romantic canopy of flowers and caged turtle doves, the better to spur them to the very heights of love. The celestial bed was novel, but not new. There's always been an array of things, oysters, champagne, Spanish fly, heart-shaped hot tubs in the Poconos, that are supposed to goad us to the heights of sexual ecstasy. Technically speaking, there is no such thing as an aphrodisiac, a substance that incites sexual desire from nothing. But there is definitely such a thing as a placebo. The word placebo is Latin for I shall please, and it's been in medical use since the 18th century because hope springs eternal in the human breast and elsewhere in the anatomy too. 
In the end, though, as the spendthrift Graham was rudely reminded when he went bust in 1784 and had to sell most of his belongings, a bed is only a bed. And indeed, today's ED, erectile dysfunction drugs, are only vasodilators. For many, their documentable effects are about the same as Graham's tilting, chiming, perfume-emitting temple to sexual intercourse. That is, they work about as well as you think they will. Research indicates that Viagra and its relatives in the class of drugs called PDE5 inhibitors are effective at improving erections only among men who actually have problems with blood flow to the penis. Contrary to what many people believe, PDE5 drugs cannot give healthy men harder or quicker erections, prolong orgasm, or intensify sexual sensation, yet thousands of men every day shell out $5 or more per dose for these drugs, with Pfizer alone making $466 million in Viagra sales in 2009. Weightlifters take them to try to mask the infamous dick limpening side effects of steroids. Men who take Prozac and other libido dampening antidepressants sometimes resort to father's little helpers. The CIA has used Viagra to bribe Afghani warlords. Since Viagra first became available in 1998, over 25 million men around the world have taken these aggressively marketed, aggressively priced, erection-promoting drugs therapeutically, recreationally, and as a security blanket. These drugs are perhaps the most frequently illegally marketed prescription drugs in the world. For le but for vast swaths of men who take them, PDE5 inhibitors are, just like every other substance touted as an aphrodisiac since the dawn of time, objectively not doing much. Viagra and their relatives are admittedly more pharmaceutically complex than, say, an oyster or a glass of champagne, but the majority of men who consume them don't actually have the cardiovascular conditions they can alleviate or suffer from vascular-related impotence. Even when they do, this is not the main focus for people who take PDE5 drugs. These drugs are sold, marketed, and taken as pleasure drugs. Pharmaceutical companies acknowledge this. Their ad campaigns for PDE5 drugs depict snuggling couples, suburban wives being swept off their feet, and in the 2007 Viva Viagra campaign, graying dude bros in a lamentably funk-free garage band jamming about the joys of pill-enhanced sex. My favorite Viagra ad, a Spanish language print ad I saw a few years ago, simply showed an image of the distinctive blue pill with the text, un divorcio menos, gracias Pfizer, one less divorce. Thanks, Pfizer. <laughs> the subtext that a lack of husbandly erections means a lack of sex for the wife and internal looming divorce speaks volumes about the place of a particular version of sexual pleasure in our current version of heterosexuality. Viagra may not seem to have much to do with sexual orientation. A drug is a drug. It works the same way no matter who takes it, regardless of their sexual preferences or partners. But the model of pleasure that Viagra is marketed to serve has a great deal to do with sexual orientation. Viagra only has one major clinical use. It first appeared as a side effect when sildenafil was still in development to create erections, the irreducible bona fide of male-identified sexual performance since the first Paleolithic cave paint or scrawled a penis on a rock wall. What they're marketing as generating and what these drugs do actually generate in the users in whom they are capable of generating anything at all is the ability to perform a particular kind of sexual act. An erect penis can penetrate any orifice, but Viagra ads make it clear that Viagra erections are intended for penetrating vaginas. The one distinctive act of heterosexual sex and the only fully legitimate source of sexual pleasure for most of Western history. So there's your little Viagra chapter. And I must note that um, Viagra is, and um, sildenafil and, and its relatives are actually used for one other clinical use, and that's for treatment of a pulmonary disorder. And in that formulation, it's exactly the same drug. It's actually usually given at significantly higher doses. It's sold under the brand name Revatio, and it's usually about a quarter of the price. So for those of you who enjoy Viagra as a recreational drug, there is your little Consumer Reports tip for the night. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what you need to know there. So I'm going to read now. Um, 
a little bit from uh, the beginning of the book. Uh, one of the questions that I've gotten a lot in talking about this book is, um, how can heterosexuality have a history? Clearly, it's natural. And so, and I knew that this question was coming because people started asking me this question as soon as I started telling people that I was writing a book about the history of heterosexuality. Um, it was that, that was the one question that everybody seemed to have right, right available, immediately available for me. Just like when I wrote um, my history of virginity in 2007, everybody said, well, that'll be a short book. Um, no, I don't think so. The manuscript I turned in for that one was a thousand pages long. My editor just about had me keel hauled. Um, I did shorten the book. It's not that much of a doorstop. Don't be worried. Um, so this is this was the answer that I wrote sort of in advance, knowing that I was going to have a whole bunch of people saying, but it's natural. Nature, the physical universe, is the baseline of our reality. It encompasses everything in, that exists that is not made by human hands, and it encompasses the humans and their hands. All the physical forces that cause natural phenomena to happen are also nature, from the weak nuclear force that helps to hold atoms together to the mysterious spark that makes the difference between life and death. Nature exists spontaneously without us having to do anything. It was here when we got here, and it will be here when we leave. This is precisely why people so often attempt to rationalize orthodoxies, their expectations and assumptions regarding human behavior based on what exists or fails to exist in nature. This is particularly true when it comes to sex, and nature arguments in regard to sexual activity between men and women in particular have been around for a very long time. Reproduction is a particularly dramatic and impressive natural phenomenon and doubly important because it's what perpetuates the species. For early Christians, reproduction was the only thing sufficiently important to justify either sexual desire or sexual activity. Every sexual behavior and every sexual desire that could not lead directly to conception soon became labeled in the church with that fateful phrase, contra naturam, against nature. The sexes of the participants were not the limiting factor in whether a sex act was against nature. The potential for reproduction was. Even for a duly married man and woman, any time, quote, someone obtains or consents that semen be spilled elsewhere than in the place deputed by nature, as medieval cleric William Peraldus put it, the church labeled it contra naturum. Fascinatingly, though, by the time Peraldus was writing in the early 13th century, the church was labeling as contra naturum even sexual activities that would have seemed on the surface to play by the reproductive rules. Historian Ruth Mezo Karras points out that against nature was openly used to condemn behaviors that are clearly not contrary to nature, notably including rear entry vaginal penetration. Any medieval man or woman would have been well aware there was nothing against nature about that, having seen animals do it. Yet it, along with any other position other than what later became known as the missionary, was decried as being against nature in terms of the manner. The church wanted, and indeed insisted upon, a version of what was natural that was identical to its orthodoxy. What churchmen were willing to condone on the basis of nature was a pretty severely edited version of actual nature. Such opportunistic and specific embraces of nature are common and telling. When, for instance, psychotherapist Richard Cohen advocated reparative therapy in 2000 to a group calling themselves Parents and Friends of Ex-Gays, he claimed that, I quote, there is no scientific data that substantiates a genetic or biologic basis for same-sex attraction. This claim is correct as far as it goes, but as we've already found out, there's no scientific data that substantiates a genetic or biologic basis for sexual orientation at all. Only willful human perversity, he implied, could explain the existence of something that is not biologically predestined. On the flip side, it has been strongly suggested in many quarters, not least the august pages of National Geographic, that same-sex sexual relationships among animals provide a legitimating natural origin and possibly even evidence of natural purpose among human beings. As University of Liverpool evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar put it, quote, anything that happens in other primates and particularly other apes is likely to have strong evolutionary continuity with what happens in humans. 
The fact that opposing viewpoints can both lay claim to natural support for their views on human sexuality should come as no surprise. Nature is vast. It contains multitudes. The only genuinely consistent aspect of the claims we make about the relationship between what happens in nature and our beliefs about what should happen in human sexuality is that human beings are the one making the claims. We would do well to consider the source. It is not nature that is so keen to tell us what's true or right or legitimate in terms of our own sexuality. What exists in nature, after all, encompasses a rather extraordinary variety of sexual activities that routinely include polygamy, polyandry, gang rape, incest, cannibalizing your mate, and the ejection of weaponized sperm packets into your mate's muscle tissue. It's rather horrifying by human standards, but that's precisely the point. Nature isn't as choosy as we are. When human beings cherry pick examples of sexual behavior in nature to buttress their own beliefs about the way sex is or should be among humans, it is almost never an accurate reflection of what nature demonstrates. As a reflection of human beliefs and values, on the other hand, it is inevitably spot on. So that's a little bit of that. Let me see how we're doing on time. I have time for a little bit more, yeah? All right. Um, so you're, you're getting a little taste for the book. It's, it does bounce around a lot. Heterosexuality is, you know, it's, writing about the history of heterosexuality is a little bit like asking a fish to write the history of water. I mean, we're so, steeped in it. It's in our, it's in every day. It's in almost every ad we see. It's in all of our presumptions about human beings and what we're supposed to be like. Um, you know, it's, it's in all, a lot of our legal controversies. I mean, if we weren't so steeped in this idea that heterosexuality is natural and normal and um, sort of just exists on its own as a universal constant, would we in fact be having a controversy over same-sex marriage? I rather doubt it. Um, so it, it's hard to get perspective on this, and it's also very hard to generate a sense of continuity when you're talking about heterosexuality because it is everywhere. Um, and this book could have been, you know, a 17-volume set. And my my editor is sitting in the back over there, and she's probably going, "Oh God, thank God, she didn't do that." Um, so um, I'm going to read a little bit from the tail end of the book. In the last chapter of the book, which is called Here There Be Dragons, I talk a little bit about some edge cases, about places where heterosexuality has a really hard time assimilating what actually happens in everyday life. And so this is a little section called A Tale of Two Spouses. When jazz pianist and father of three, Billy Tipton, died in Spokane, Washington in 1989, the American media exploded in shock. The 75-year-old man was a woman. No one, it seemed, knew this except Tipton himself. His children, informally adopted, had only ever known Tipton as their father. Tipton's five common-law wives, including his last wife, a former stripper named Kitty Oaks, apparently believed and had no reason to doubt his story that a car accident in Tipton's youth had mangled his ribcage and his genitals, leaving him impotent and necessitating the wearing of protective bandages. Tipton's life had its ups and downs, like any other. His marriages tended not to work out very well, and his last wife was abusive enough that Tipton ended up raising his youngest child as a solo father. His career was only modestly successful, much of it spent working out of Spokane's Grand Dame of a Gilded Age hotel, the Davenport. He was a loving parent, though, and he managed to make a consistent living in a notoriously fickle industry, and those aren't small things. Still, Billy Tipton's most impressive performance was his seamless, completely successful life as a man. Hindsight, of course, is 2020. After Tipton's death and the revelation of his biological sex, journalists and biographers would look at photos of the baby-faced Tipton and wonder how people could not have known. Tipton's wives claims that they simply accepted the car wreck story and adjust adjusted to the perhaps not entirely unwelcome idea that the man in their lives was infertile and more interested in their pleasure than his own, were weighed in the balance and found barely credible. But the fact remains that Tipton's children upon hearing that their father was a biological woman were so hurt and stunned that two of them changed their last names. 
more remarkable still was the legal reaction. After Kitty Oaks died in 2007, a Spokane County probate court upheld the Tipton children's right of inheritance. In effect, by allowing Jonathan Clark, Scott Miller, and Billy Tipton Jr. to inherit, the court affirmed the legitimacy of a highly unorthodox family. The three children were biologically unrelated, either to one another or to their parents. None were ever legally adopted. The parents were never legally married and were, in fact, both of the same biological sex. But with both Tipton and Oaks dead, the judge ruled, there was no reason to make their children accountable for the fact that their parents had chosen not to play by the rules. The Spokane Spokesman Review headline writer had quite a job composing a headline to convey it. It read, Judge, Billy Tipton's, quote, sons, end quote, can inher inherit their, quote, mother's estate. <laughs> it was a noteworthy decision. Washington law does not ordinarily permit unofficially adopted children not named in a will to inherit. In this instance, however, the judge agreed with the attorney for Oaks's estate that even though the three Tipton children knew they were adopted and that Kitty Oaks was not their biological mother, and I quote, the Tiptons were a family. For Superior Court Judge Michael Price, being a family, regardless of paperwork or even the biological sexes of the parents, was in the end enough. In the case of Christy Lee Littleton, on the other hand, being family was nowhere near enough. Nor was having done everything, including changing legal and physical sex, strictly by the book. Born male and Christian, christened Lee Cavazos in San Antonio, Texas in 1952, Christy Lee Littleton felt from toddlerhood that she should have been female. This distressed her parents and the doctors to whom they took their child, but the regimens of male hormones to which Littleton was subjected in an attempt at masculinization therapy didn't change her mind. By the time Christy Lee was uh, 17 years old, she'd begun to seek out a sex change, and when she was 23, she managed to become part of a program at the University of Texas that would finally assist her in changing her hormones and her anatomy. In 1977, she changed her name to Christy Lee. In 1979, the genital surgeries that rendered her medically female were complete. And in 1989, the happily female Christy Lee Cavazos, radiant in white lace, married Jonathan Mark Littleton in Kentucky, where they met and settled down to a pleasant, unremarkable life, later moving back to Texas. It should have been a happily ever after story, the kind of gender normative heterosexual marriage that conservative pundits praise as the backbone of traditional society. And for seven years it was. And then tragically, Jonathan Littleton died before his time. After a period of mourning her husband, Christy decided to open a case against her late husband's physician, Mark Prang, for medical malpractice leading to wrongful death. Was there actual medical malpractice involved in Mr. Littleton's death? We probably will never know. Certainly there has never been a verdict on the case because almost, immedi almost immediately, Mrs. Littleton's attempts to seek redress in the matter of her husband's death were derailed by something she surely thought she had put behind her, her previous life of being identified as male. Dr. Prang's lawyer's counterargument in the suit was a simple one. Christy Lee Littleton, they said, was not entitled to file suit as Jonathan Littleton's next of kin for the simple reason that the marriage between the two of them could not possibly have been valid. Because Mrs. Littleton had begun life as a boy, because her sex cells carried XY chromosomes, and because, as they argued, sex reassignment only changed the appearance, not the facts of biology, she could not be in a legally valid marriage to a biological man. Determined to get her case heard, Christy Littleton and her lawyers pushed the case through multiple appeals. After the Texas Fourth Court of Appeals refused to acknowledge the validity of her marriage, she and her legal team took the case to the Texas State Supreme Court in hopes that a review of the law would have a positive result. It failed. The US Supreme Court has also refused to review the case. For all intents and purposes, Christy Littleton has no recourse with regard to the death of her spouse, a state of affairs of which the federal judiciary apparently approves. Where things rest, at least in Texas, is that it is possible for an individual US state to decide that sex is determined solely by chromosomes, that it comes in two and only two types, and that it cannot be meaningfully legally changed regardless of medical interventions. This, as Christy Littleton and many commentators on the case have pointed out, is not only mean-spirited and reductive, but ignorant. The law is, of course, not obligated to be kind, and it is certainly not obligated to recognize the quality 
possibility of familiness that appears to have moved the judge in the Billy Tipton case. But one could make the argument, as indeed Littleton and her team have tried, that the state should recognize the evidence that clearly demonstrates that sex is nowhere near a binary affair. Biology, as it happens, agrees with Christy Littleton. Although the majority of people have sex chromosomes that match one of two primary types, XY for males, XX for females, a sizable minority of people, including my own partner, as you may recall, have chromosomes of some other type or types. Not only can an individual have a single set of sex chromosomes that are neither XX or XY, they can have, for instance, XXY or XYY or XO, but they could also have different sets of sex chromosomes in different cells due to the phenomena known as mosaicism and chimerism. My partner, who is genetically intersex, is also an example of genetic mosaicism. He has some cells with XY chromosomes and others with XXY chromosomes. One wonders which a court would consider authoritative. <laughs> if my partner and I married in Texas, would our marriage be valid? It might if the court, in its Solomonic wisdom, were to take the opinion that a certain single person's genome could be split in half. But even this would only make our marriage binding if my sex chromosomes are what I assume they are. Like most people, like most of you here, I don't know what my own karyotype is. It's quite possible that I, like hundreds of thousands of other people, have been intersex all my life, and I just don't know it. No government, including Texas's, has yet made getting your genes karyotyped a prerequisite for applying for a marriage license. If Texas or any other locality is going to limit marriage to people whose genes conform to a particular pattern, that's a problem. People don't fall in love with their chromosomes. They don't have sex with their chromosomes, and they certainly don't get married with their chromosomes. Sex is more than genetics. As medical technology gets more sophisticated and we learn about even more varieties and variations of biological sex, it becomes ever clearer that thinking of biological sex as binary might be convenient, but it sure isn't accurate. This is also true when it comes to thinking of biological sex as fixed and unchanging. While it is true that as the Texas Appeals Court wrote in October 1999, quote, the male chromosomes don't change with either hormonal treatment or sex reassignment surgery. Biologically, a post-operative female transsexual is still a male. It is also true that the scalpel cuts both ways. Anatomically, a trans woman who's undergone a vaginoplasty, the surgical removal of penis, scrotum, and testicles, and the creation of a vagina and vulva has functionally the same genital anatomy as any biological female who's had a hysterectomy. Two such women may also be quite hormonally similar given the tendency for post-hysterectomy patients to be given hormone replacement therapy. Biology isn't destiny. It isn't even necessarily permanent. If medical, and even if medical expertise and technology didn't provide us with the means to identify and understand nature's biological bounty and create our own, Gender would still be complex and unpredictable. As the historical record bears out, there have always been Billy Tiptons. Male privilege can be very motivating. Women have lived as men in order to follow God, obtain educations, join the professions, support their families, and go to war, in addition to doing it so they could love other women without being persecuted. Historical examples of men living as women are thinner on the ground, probably in part because to abandon masculinity is to abandon power. Still, we do know that men have lived as women, either temporarily or long term, in order to escape from danger, to go undercover, and in rare cases like that of the legendary 18th century diplomat and spy, the Chevalier Deon, apparently just because they felt like it. Our culture has yet to come to grips with this. The hopeless hodgepodge of our Western legal approaches to sex and gender is just one result of our incomplete grasp of sex. It makes no logical sense that Christy Littleton has been denied, rather vindictively it would appear, the same humane legal consideration of her social identity and her marriage that Billy Hip Tipton received posthumously. Would lifting the heavy hand of the binary sex and gender system from the law really mean, as conservative critics sometimes say it will, the end of marriage and the traditional family? It doesn't seem likely. Nor would it necessarily spell the end of heterosexuality. Surely, if male and female are two of a variety of sexes and masculine and feminine are two of a variety of genders, then heterosexual and homosexual would be two of a variety of ways you could combine them. 
Egalitarianism, human rights, and civil rights are slowly but surely forcing the hand of the law. The law may not eagerly embrace the complexities of sex and gender, but the more human beings continue to exist in ways that challenge the borders and dynamics of heterosexual and homosexual, the more the law will be compelled to find a way to answer. So that is, I think, all I'm going to read. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Thank you all so much. That is, a, that is a wonderful question. Um, what was, the question is, what, what, how were we thinking, basically, about sexuality before the term heterosexuality existed? Um, the answer is that it depends on where you go and when you go in history. But more or less, the, the primary concern was, are people doing something that is legitimate and correct by the standards of our time or in our area, or are they not? And um, you know, the, the famous example that everyone trots out is ancient Greece. Um, adult elite men in ancient Greece, almost all of them married women because legally they had to. Um, very, many, 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 many of them had relationships as well with other men um, for pleasure, out of sense of social obligation, because it was expected of them for many different reasons. And these things coexisted. There was a a form of, if you will, bisexuality, which is also a very modern term that I hesitate to use for something that happened that long ago. But functionally speaking, um, these are people who lived their lives in a society where there was no contradiction between loving men and loving women. And in fact, the medical system of that era held that sexual response happened in men, because they had an abundance of heat in their bodies, when they saw beautiful bodies. That it was, it was beauty, it was like, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, beauty, oh my god, must have it. Um, and, that, and, and sometimes this could be a problem. Pythagoras, for instance, was um, very keen that um, men reduce the heat in their bodies, especially during the summer when it was already very hot, because um, it could get excessive, and then you could, you, could, you could sort of leach too much heat out of your body, and you could become kind of droopy and sad. And um, so but it's a very different way of thinking about desire and a very different way of thinking about what's sexually permissible and what's sexually okay and what's sexually normal. Another example that I like to talk about is in, um, in 14th century Venice, um, there was a move made by the city fathers to, found, uh, to open up a municipal brothel, um, which seems like an odd step to take if you're um, in the 14th century and it's a kind of a Catholic country. But the reason that they were doing this was because they perceived that in Venice they had such a problem with beautiful young elite men going out and sleeping with other beautiful young elite men that they wanted to give them an opportunity, this is the Uffizio de Onesta, the Office of Honesty, wanted to give them an opportunity to, to have legitimate sex, i.e. sex with women, which even if they weren't married to them, even if the women were whores, was still more legitimate than sleeping with boys. <laughs> so at the same time, you see, you see this sort of tiered system in this case of what's considered acceptable and normal and what's considered something that this society can include within itself in, a, in an above board way. Um, they were not saying these homosexuals have got to go. They were saying, clearly, if we just give them the opportunity to sleep with women, they will, and God likes that better. <laughs> so they, weren't, they, they just weren't thinking. It wasn't about identity. It wasn't about, oh, well, these people are clearly born that way, and this is what they must do. It was about, well, you know, yeah, they're out having sex with each other, and we need to give them a better opportunity. You know, hugs, not drugs, <laughs> um, really, was kind of the mentality there. So um, the the... The way I, I like to say that um, same-sex sexuality, prior to sort of the demonization of, of homosexuality and the, this idea that there is an essence in human beings that corresponds to who you want to have sex with, homosexuality, yes, a crime in the eyes of the church, but the kind of crime that any could happen to anybody. This was evidence of temptation unsuccessfully resisted, not evidence that you were a special kind of human being. And if you go and you look at even canon law right now, canon law is still sitting there waiting for you to go and, I don't know, burn it, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that, it, that's still what canon law says. I mean, sodomy law hasn't, sodomy law in the eyes of the Catholic Church has not changed a whole lot since about the ninth century. Um, so the Catholic Church is actually still operating officially with, um, with this pre-heterosexual homosexual uh, idea of what sodomy is. It's, it's non-reproductive sex between two anybody's. It doesn't matter. So that's, that's sort of the, the long-winded answer to a very good question. Uh, anybody else? Um, actually, no. Okay. Actually, no. It's really, that's really a good question, and it's be been very hard to trace okay. um, exactly how that happens. It, it seems to be something that mostly comes out of the psychological literature. Freud does have a lot to do with it. Um, Freud, Freud's ideas on sexuality are very interesting in a lot of ways, but I think mechanically what's really interesting is this notion that there is no adult sexuality that is automatic. All adult sexualities have to be arrived at through this rather tortuous process of child development. You have to go through these stages, and there's anal, and there's oral, and there's edible, and there's mommy, and there's daddy, and there's penises, and envy, and all these things. And it doesn't work the same way for girls as it works for boys. No one knows why. He doesn't explain why that should be true. He didn't know he was making it up. Um, but nevertheless, nevertheless, in Freud, this is a process. One is not born heterosexual or homosexual or anything else, one becomes this. It is a voyage that you take that begins at birth that is very complex and very fraught and there are all kinds of things that can go wrong with it and leave you with neuroses and crippling problems. And if you are very lucky and you have all the right circumstances and this sort of perfect storm of of influences on your psychosexual development, then you end up in this sort of perfect 19th century Viennese bougie model of heterosexuality. That's the prize, that's the gold ring. So um, that's, really, um, that's really where this idea that this is an interior Thing starts to coalesce, as, as Freud's writing about it, as Kraft Ebing is writing about it, as all the psychiatrists are writing about and trying to tease out, okay, well, what's the difference between sex that we don't think is problematic and sex that we do think is problematic? What's the difference between these desires, these unproblematic desires and these problematic desires, and where, oh, where do these problematic desires come from? And the model that they chose to go with was a, a, a pathology, that this was a, in some way a pathology, whether it was a pathology of body or a pathology of mind, or a pathology of forces acting on the mind, as in Freud, was really an open question. Um, and it got simplified, as things do when they escape from the academy. And, um, and eventually we did end up with this notion that you know, this, is, this is an inborn, an innate characteristic. And partly that was a defense move. Um, very openly and overtly a defense move as um, gay identity movements began to form. Um, because uh, and I, I have problems with this part of identity politics personally um, because saying, but I was born this way and therefore you cannot, you know, you cannot give me a hard time about this. And that's worked so well for women and people of color. I feel, I feel that, um, that everyone should use it. <laughs> Um, but, you know, but in fact it is a useful tool and it has gotten us, uh, it has gotten us a fair few miles down the road, a very difficult road. Um, and one of the, one of the sort of key moments actually I think in solidifying that uh, was when Harry Hay of the Mattachine Society took the first Kinsey report and took Kinsey's numbers and um, I think smoked a little pot perhaps because I have, and I and other people have looked for how exactly he got the one in 10 statistic out of Kinsey and we can't do the math the way he did the math. But um, yeah, but, but came up with this notion that look, here I have this huge stack of statistics and it says that one in 10 people are primarily or exclusively attracted to members of their same biological sex. And that I think really was, um, was a huge sort of public um, political, you know, flag in the ground to say, you know, this is, this is an, we have a statistic, we have a, a measurable minority, it has to come from somewhere and we're just gonna say that, you know, we're all just this way, this is just the way we are. Because that way you can't come down our throats. 
Um, so it's like all of these ideas, you know, and the problem with history of ideas, as I said before, it's not a neat, tidy little chronological history. You know, there's, um, there are very few commemorative stamps, uh, <laughs> alas. Um, wouldn't you like to lick a heterosexual commemorative stamp? I would. <laughs> and um, so, you know, these are ideas that take, they take time to form. They take time to sink in, and they certainly take time to become orthodoxy. And that's one that's been very, very successful. Yeah, uh, the question is, um, did, the, did Western culture um, give our notions of heterosexuality and homosexuality to the rest of the world? And how's the rest of the world doing with that? Um, and the answer is yes, in point of fact. It is one of our, one of our more successful exports. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it has done remarkably well. Um, there are a number of folks um, a lot smarter than me who are doing work on the ground in a lot of countries around the world about the history of homosexuality and heterosexuality and the use of that kind of terminology and our sort of Western apparatus of sexual orientation in other cultures, um, some of which I have read, a lot of which I have not, because um, I am I'm primarily an Americanist and, and definitely someone who spends most of her time historically in the West. Um, Brett Hinch, who I believe is at Yale, um, wrote a fantastic book on, called Passions of the Cut Sleeve on homosexuality in China. And, on, and part of the book, is, it's primarily a historical book about um, imperial era customs, or late imperial era customs, but he also writes a wonderful preface to the book about sort of the emergence of the notion of the homosexual in China and how that changed um, what had existed in imperial culture, because very, very like um, ancient Greece, imperial, late imperial Chinese cultures um, often had a sort of an unspoken rule that if you were a very elite man, um, it was, you were married, you had a wife, you produced legitimate offspring, and there were also beautiful young men in your life. And in fact, the, the, the phrase, the passion of the cut sleeve, refers to a, a story in which uh, s some lord or another had this beautiful young boy lover with whom he was so smitten that when his lover fell asleep with his head on, on the lord's very ornate flowing sleeve, rather than wake his lover up, he cut his sleeve off when he had to get up. So, which is, isn't that sweet? <laughs> um, so yeah, we have export. We have we have exported that all around the world. We've exported that notion all around the world. Um, how other cultures have fared with it really varies. Um, a lot of cultures. I mean, we've seen a lot of examples, for particularly um, sub-Saharan Africa, have taken that ball and run with it to the point of saying, "Oh yes, homosexuals ought to be, you know, killed," um, because that's a good way to get rid of them. Um, yeah, whatever. I'm not sure how that works, but anyway. Um, other cultures have kind of looked at it and gone, hmm, what do you do with that? Eh, you know, and, and stuck with more or less um, culturally indigenous models of how sexuality works. Some cultures have sort of found a middle ground. Um, and there, there are, one of the examples that has been raised uh, a lot are um, in, in both India and Thailand, there are very, uh, very public and very well-known third, third gender individuals who, you know, are occupying this, this space in the culture that really problematizes the whole idea that there are boys and there are girls and there are different ways that you can combine boys and girls and that makes heterosexual and homosexual. Well, uh, as far until you have this third gender person and then um, what the hell do you do with that? So um, you find that there are cultures that simultaneously can talk about heterosexual and homosexual, straight and gay, and also include an indigenous third gender custom that really sort of throw, knocks that whole system into a cocked hat. And nobody really seems to care. Because this is just the way we've always done things, basically. And it works. Um, I think that I am officially out of time. I am more than happy to sign books, um, answer questions, or attempt to, or make something up if you like. Um, <laughs> just tell me if that's what you want, Holly. Um, but thank you all. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's lovely. Thanks so much. <laughs>